Guru, thank you very much for this invitation to speak. And I would like to thank Ambassador Masood bin Moben, my dear colleague, and um, to uh, ask me to make this presentation. And I felt a little bit challenged when he asked me to do that, because it is not often that you speak about the father of the nation and elaborate your thoughts about him. Uh, but looking around uh, uh, the audience here, I find that um, uh, at least my age, being the oldest person here, I can share some of the connections that I had with the father of the nation. Uh, on the podium, you will find, and Masood already in his uh, welcoming remarks mentioned about Bongo Bundhu's philosophy of life, the policy uh, that uh, he initiated in Bangladesh, which still uh, continues to guide our uh, nation. Uh, our, my other diplomatic colleagues here will be sharing, I believe, many aspects uh, as they see of Bangabandhu's life. So let me, in that case, try to share some personal uh, reflections of myself with Bangabandhu. He was, for many of us, a larger-than-life phenomenon. He is immense presence in our liberation struggle, in our independent uh, nationhood, is, is immeasurable. And that is what impresses me all the time as I think about him. The word bongo bondhu, translated in English or any other language, I believe, will not say exactly what it means when we say it in our language, in Bangla. The emotions involved in it, the uh, sentiments involved in it, the connection involved in it is not easily translated when, uh, when we say friend of Bengal. So that is what I believe is what is in the, the heart of all Bangladesh people. Bangabandhu keeps on his presence in all of us in various different ways. And as, as a young person, young official diplomat, when the liberation struggle started in Bangladesh, I was inspired like many of us. I think that inspiration to work for the freedom of our motherland kept on getting stronger and stronger in me. 7th of March, 1971, we know about his famous speech in which he literally called for the independence of Bangladesh. And I'm very delighted that two years ago, UNESCO put this speech as a memory of the world, uh, in, into the memory of the world register. All these documents of global importance and historical importance had been put into that register. And I'm delighted to find that our um, inspiration, the speech that inspired all of us to fight for the independence of Bangladesh had been recognized as such. I was already in 1971, I was already working as a Pakistani diplomat in India. 
I had joined the Pakistan Sur Foreign Service in 1967. But staying in India, closest to Bangladesh, I evidenced directly kind of brutality that the military crackdown brought over the people of Bangladesh. And I could see it, and Bongo Bondu's words on 7th of March kept on resonating in me. Our struggle is for the freedom of Bangladesh, freedom struggle. Our struggle is for independence struggle. And that continued uh, to haunt me all the time. And I said, we, I and our other colleagues in India, uh, Bangladeshi diplomats, should do something. And that is when we, what can be called, we uh, prepared our little mutiny on the bounty scenario. We, we decided to establish Bangladesh's physical diplomatic presence outside the territory of Bangladesh. And that was the moment when we, the Bangladesh diplomats and the staff in that mission uh, and in that Pakistani mission took over the mission as and flew the Bangladesh first flag of independent Bangladesh was flown over that mission in India, in Kolkata. And on 18th of April, we waited because 17th of April, the first government, independent government of Bangladesh was formed in Mujib Nagar. And we felt that we have a government, an authority to owe our allegiance to. Because otherwise, you will be uh, isolated uh, without any recognition. So that is what happened, and that became the diplomatic, first diplomatic outpost of Bangladesh. And my responsibility at that time as a second secretary in that mission was to attract other Bangladeshi colleagues worldwide as a part of Pakistani Foreign Service to come out and declare allegiance for Bangladesh. And we had one after the other mission, the Bangladesh colleagues came out. And that created a, a, an energy for in support of the liberation war. And they, we continued to do that one after the other. And uh, uh, many came out uh, to, to owe allegiance in Bangladesh. And that very fact that a diplomat has left his sort of comfortable life in the Foreign Service to come out and declare allegiance for a government which is not yet fully liberated. So that, the, though in those countries where the diplomats came out, that created a big, big uh, impact on that country's policy about Bangladesh. And also, during that time in 1971, we had attempted um, many times, and sometimes successfully, to send uh, the spokesperson of Bangladesh government to speak for our recognition by the international community. We had the opportunity of getting the support of number of countries in the United Nations. I remember uh, we had sent many people to come here. And I also relate the, the, to the scene that you saw when Bongo Bondu returned from the Pakistani prison his homecoming day, 10th of January. And as you saw, hundreds of thousands of people gathered to listen to him. I was one of them. 
I listened to him directly that day in Bangladesh. And then I think Bangabandhu's government's one of the top priority was to recognize the, uh, the to get a recognition for Bangladesh at the United Nations for its membership. And in 1972, in June of 1972, I was sent here to New York to work for that, along with my another senior colleague who was here before me, but I was given that responsibility to work. And then I remember I was in the chamber of the Security Council when Bangladesh's application for membership was vetoed by a permanent member of the United Nations. And that stalled our effort to be recognized. And it took us two more years in 1974 to become. And in the meantime, we had the strategy. And that, again, I should say, due to the, the work and the effort that Bangabandhu himself put in by going over to the Commonwealth Heads of State meeting Go, um, heads of government meeting, going to the non-aligned summit, going to the organization of Islamic uh, State summit, and all these efforts was intended to get the UN membership. And I believe that the efforts, and I am very proud to say that uh, a select group of five permanent representatives in New York decided to work as the go-between the Pakistani government and other interested countries to, to make that membership possible. And that was a, a wonderful experience, an eye-opening experience, how diplomacy, how bringing together the five ambassadors representing five different regions of the world came together to help Bangladesh, how, how to, to uh, block um, the, the resistance that is there. And uh, I was directly connected, and my responsibility was also to work to see and maintain contact with the Chinese representatives here to see how best their concerns can be rested to get the membership. And I am one, I, I, it, said, it was a wonderful experience to talk to the Chinese representative who later became China's representative to resolve or settle the transfer of the territory of Hong Kong to China. And that uh, gentleman one day met me at the delegates lounge and say, you can ask your government to resubmit your application for membership. So that was a clear hint that China was ready to support. And that excited all of us. And finally, on the 17th of September, 1974, Bangladesh became the 136th member of the United Nations. We have 193 now. So that was the day of big, uh, along with us also, as a as an, uh, sort of a, a important point, that Grenada and Guinea-Bissau also became the 137 and 138 member of the United Nations. And I remember the three flags were flown uh, at that time, and our membership was gaveled by 
the president of the General Assembly, Abdul Aziz Buteflika. So he uh, was there, the flag uh, raising ceremony, and Bangladesh Foreign Minister, and Secretary General Kurt Waldheim. All of them were there to, to recognize Bangladesh's sovereign existence in the world. <clears throat> On the 25th September, I remember, and this speech was mentioned in the video that you saw. Bongo Bondu speak in this building, in the General Assembly Hall, on the 25th of September. And he spoke in Bangla, as was mentioned. And I think that that recognition of Bengali, Bangla, as an at the Global Forum was a big achievement for us. Because Bangla um, is maybe the eighth or ninth largest, uh, 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 ninth uh, most widely spoken language, but the, to give the speech in Bangla, Bongo Bondu created a big history. And I think all of that came out of the, the language movement in 1952 in Bangladesh, which triggered the independence movement of Bangladesh, and then which has been recognized as, the, uh, as, uh, as, um, uh, as a language for which people gave their life and has been recognized as an International Mother Language Day, the 21st of February, 1952, that happened. So this, these are the connections that brings us the relevance of Bengali nation, Bengali identity in the world. And I believe that uh, being a witness to those inspires, continues to inspire me uh, even today. And I would like to um, mention here that uh, Bongo Bondhu personally met the American president, and I was present there when, uh, not when he met, but present in the preparations of his visit, 1st of October, 1974. He met President Gerald Ford at that time. And Bongo Bondhu, at that time, Bangladesh was in a very serious economic difficulties. And he connected the international relationship or um, uh, uh, foreign policy uh, as role as uh, bringing in humanitarian assistance in a big way. So that, that was a big thing. So let me embrace and let me say that uh, at, on that occasion, I think uh, as I was there as an uh, officer to, to be of assistance to him, and I reached uh, his room, and his assistant told him about a good news from my family. And Bongo Bondhu, I must say that I still feel the shivers in myself. He came forward and embraced me. And that, that is the biggest joyous moment for me, that the father of the nation embraced me warmly, wholeheartedly, and that, that day will be ever living in me all the time. Bongo Bodhu's, the main tenet of his foreign policy was friendship for all and malice towards none. And I think that has, that foundational anchor and guiding principle has led Bangladesh to be uh, a, 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 a big believer in multilateralism, its faith in the United Nations, and its work still is being guided by those spirits, those inspirations. And I think that foundational um, uh, anchor has been followed by 
all the subsequent governments of Bangladesh. It doesn't matter which, uh, which uh, uh, party or government is in power. I think Bangladesh's multilateral foreign policy has been the one that has been laid forth by Bangabandhu forever. And I think Bangladesh has left, if I can say from my side, an indelible and permanent legacy in the history of the United Nations through its work for the culture of peace and for women's equality of participation through the Security Council Resolution 1325. And I think both were achieved under the leadership of somebody who is the best inheritor of Bangabandhu's philosophy and policy in the true sense of the term. Yes, it is under Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina that this was achieved. And it was my pleasure and honor for being the permanent representative of Bangladesh during his, her first term as the Prime Minister. So I believe that this, this the, in the message of the Prime Minister, it was said that the, the assassins took away Bangabandhu's life, but his soul lives on. And that is what I believe is the message I want to leave here. Speaking at the United Nations, I would like to say he is not only a Bongo Bondhu to all Bengalis, but he is truly a Bisho Bondhu, which means friend of the world. Thank you.